Part 1. You will hear a man inquiring about joining a wildlife conservation society. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Wildlife Conservation Society, good afternoon. Can I help you? Oh, hello. Uh, yes, I'd like to join, please. Oh, yes, certainly. I'll just get some details from you. Could I have your name? Michael Jones. Right. And can I ask where you heard about us? Was it in an advert, or did a friend tell you, or... Neither, actually. It was a radio program. Then I just got your number from the phone book. Oh, right. Uh, now I need some membership details. It's Michael Jones, and the address? 21 Beale Street. OK. Leeds. Fine. And do you know your postcode? Yes, it's uh, LS... 14, 2, J, W. OK. And do you have a daytime telephone number we can contact you on? Yes, you can call me at work. The number's 011-73-586642. And I can give you my office email address if you like. That'd probably be useful. Yes, please. It's mj at... Hennings.co.uk Is that H-E-N-N-I-N-G-S? That's right. Thank you. Now, I just need to ask you some questions about exactly what you want. First of all, how long do you want the membership for? We do two, three and five year memberships and we also do one for life. Uh, I think I'll just get the minimum length this time around. Fine. And then the type of membership. We do single, joint or family, which covers up to four children. Well, we haven't got any children. But I think I'll get the joint one because my wife will probably want to do the activities with me. Yes. Fine. Let me see. That'll be £49 altogether then, please. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. How would you like to pay? Uh, by direct debit? No problem. I just need your bank details. Can you give me the name first? It's the Union Bank. And now I've got your name, but I need your account number. Ah, uh, uh, 01 05 OK. When would you like to start payment? Next month, on the 1st of October, or...? Can you make it the 15th instead? No problem. The membership will begin then, too. Is that all right? That's fine. I'll just give you a reference number in case there's any problem. Have you got a pen? Uh, yes. It's JYZ37. And we'll be sending you an information pack within a few days. Is there anything else? Uh, oh, yes. Could you send me an additional one? I've got a friend who's very interested. Certainly. No problem. I'll make a note of that. There's also a video we can send you if you like. There's no charge. Yes, please. That'll be great. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman talking on a radio program about a festival that is about to take place. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 18. I have in the studio with me Mary Smith from Yorktown Tourism, who is here to tell us about some of the events happening in our state capital over the next three weeks at the Spring Festival. So, Mary, what can we expect to see? Well, it's such an exciting time to be in Yorktown. To kick off the Spring Festival, There'll be a huge firework display down by the lake starting at 9pm this Saturday, the 4th of September. Over 10,000 fireworks will be set off, all choreographed to music and broadcast simultaneously here on Radio Yorkie. You should get there early if you want to get close to the action. So, bring along a picnic and a blanket, as it could get chilly in the evening. One of the things that attracts visitors to the festival from all over the country is the amazing collection of flowers on show in Central Park throughout the festival. Special buses will run from the town centre to the show at 20 minute intervals for those of you who prefer to take public transport. If you're interested in seeing the latest in cars, from the fastest to the most expensive, then head over to the Motor Show at the Exhibition Centre from the 10th to the 15th of September. It'll be open daily from 9am until 10pm. So you can even pop there after work. Do you like photography? Then go along to Grow Your Imagination, an exhibition of photographs of famous gardens which will be held at the Art Gallery from the 11th to the 19th of September. Come and be inspired by some of the world's most beautiful gardens. I've had a sneak preview of some of the photographs, and they are magnificent. If music is more your scene, then you should come and hear the Australian Philharmonic Orchestra performing Swing in Spring at the Concert Hall on Friday the 17th and Saturday the 18th of September. It's a celebration of dance music from the 1940s and 50s. There'll be three performances. Both evenings start at 7pm and a matinee performance at 2.30 on the Saturday. So, get your dancing shoes on and head there. It's guaranteed to get your feet tapping. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20 Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Those are just a few of the attractions on offer. But for something a little different, you could try Balloons Down Under, which is the largest gathering of hot air balloons in the Southern Hemisphere. It's well worth it, because there'll be over 25 balloons of all shapes and sizes, which is a truly amazing sight. I'm also happy to announce that one lucky person will get the chance to go up in one of these balloons absolutely free. That's the prize in our special Spring Festival competition. It'd normally cost you $200, so it's not a bad prize, eh? I'm sure you all want a chance to win, so you'll need to fill out the entry form in today's edition of the Yorktown News. 
don't forget to include your phone number and send it to Radio Yorkie. Make sure your entry reaches us by 5pm on Thursday the 9th of September. Then, to see if you've won, just check out the festival's website on Saturday the 11th of September, where we'll publish the name of the lucky winner. It's such a fantastic prize, so hurry up and get your entry in. So, there you have it. Just a few of the special events happening here in Yorktown over the Spring Festival. And if you'd like any more details about the festival... The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a student called Paul talking to a tutor about a course he is thinking of doing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Come in. You're Paul, are you? Yes. I spoke to you on the phone. Yes. Have a seat. You wanted to talk to me about the archaeology course? Yes. Uh, I've read the handbook, but I'd like to find out a few more details before I decide whether to do it. Right. Yes. What would you like to know? Well, first of all, can I combine the archaeology course with one in anthropology? Yes, you can combine it with any other subject apart from classical history. Hmm. That's simply because there's some overlap in the lecture times for those two courses. We weren't able to coordinate them. OK, fine. And could you tell me about the modules? Well, in the first semester, there are three. All of them are compulsory. We don't offer optional modules till next year. Right. The first one focuses on what can be learned from specific artefacts, such as pottery and stone tools. It's called Object Matters, and it's taught by Dr. Morris. Is that... Uh, how is the module presented? I mean, is it lectures? We refer to the means of presentation as the learning method, and in this case, it's lectures integrated with practical sessions, so it's a mixture. What about the content? I suppose we'll be looking at different kinds of archaeological remains and how to date them and so on. To some extent, but the module is basically about processes. First of all, recording material, then classification, then interpretation of the data. That's how archaeologists draw conclusions about their findings. And finally, display. Is that OK? I think so. Yes, thanks. Uh, one other thing. How is the module assessed? Is there an exam? No, it's all based on coursework. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. And the second module, that's the one called Towns and Cities, is taught by our department head, Professor Elliot. 
and, as the name suggests, the modules about the origins of built environments and how they developed. That's mainly factual, then, I suppose? It is, really. And for that reason, the assessment's by examination. But you may be pleased to know it's an oral rather than a written exam, and... It sounds a bit scary. <laughs> oh, no. Most of our students find they actually enjoy it, so don't worry too much. OK. And then the title of the third module is Method and Science. And in that, Dr. Thompson will be introducing you to the standard techniques used in archaeological fieldwork and analysis. Things like excavating and dating. What about the learning method for this module? Are there any lectures, or is it all laboratory work? Oh, it's half lab work and half seminars. There aren't any lectures. Then, right at the end of the module, you'll take part in a site survey. The date for that is week beginning the 10th of March, but I can't tell you the location yet. That'll be announced later. But I think you'll find it very useful. Yes, I know someone who went on that last... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. We'll hear a talk about the effects of our digital world on young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we're looking at changes occurring due to the rapid spread of digital technology in the last decades of the 20th century. By digital technology, I include any computer-related devices such as email, the internet, cell phones, instant messaging, to name but a few. Today's lecture focuses on the ideas of Mark Prensky and what he believes are the major effects that high exposure to digital technology has had on young people today. Firstly, what exactly does Prensky believe? He argues that because today's young people have been born into a digital world and spend hours simply playing with technology, they've changed in fundamental ways. He believes they're evolving differently and as a result, process information differently from previous generations. It's even possible that these young people's brains have physically changed, although whether this is literally true isn't yet known. Nor does Prensky go quite this far. Prensky divides people into digital natives and digital immigrants. Today's young people are the digital natives, and they belong in this new digital age because they were born into it and grew up as native speakers of the digital language of computer technology, whereas digital immigrants are those born in the generations before the digital age. Just as those who learn a second language often retain their foreign accent, the immigrants are usually, in varying degrees, not quite as effective at speaking the digital language as the natives are. For example, they're more comfortable finding phone numbers using a phone book or looking up information in an encyclopedia, rather than using the Internet as a primary source of information. Prensky calls this the digital accent. Another example of the digital accent is scanning a manual for a computer program rather than assuming the program itself will teach you how to use it. Basically, people with a digital accent 
have never really stopped relying on their original non-digital means of sourcing information. They prefer doing things as they've always done them, without typing something into a computer. Prensky predicts that due to all this, changes are in store, mainly in the area of education. But what do other educators and theorists such as Thomas Allen, Samuel James, and Peter Vander believe? Samuel James, from Sydney University, agrees with Prensky's predictions. He believes that educators are no longer successful in the way they teach. However, not surprisingly, Prensky has been criticized by more traditional theorists, like Peter Vander and Thomas Allen. They disagree with many of Prensky's assertions. Vander argues that a typical classroom is more varied than Prensky believes, with students coming from a range of backgrounds. He maintains that a large percentage of these students are not necessarily proficient with technology, and not all students today fit the one stereotype. And Allen adds that even though most students today have easy access to technology, some just don't find the digital medium appealing. James disagrees, though. He believes that all today's students do share the same basic interest in and knowledge of digital technology. However, James believes our younger students can communicate with their digital immigrant teachers and can still learn using methods which have proven to be successful in the past. James's theories are taken a step further by Allen, who recognizes that both digital immigrants and natives have to deal with vast amounts of information in today's electronic society. Allen maintains that while most young students are proficient in playing computer games and using the web in quite basic ways, they're not used to using the computer at advanced levels. For example, to conduct complex information searches, which are so necessary for university study today. Irrespective of Allen's research, James believes it's possible for computer games to play a major role in making classroom learning more stimulating, and he cites many instances where this would be possible today. However, Vander asserts that rather than focusing on developing games, we should think of better ways to assist teachers because no computer program comes close to doing what a human teacher does every day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.